let's hop to the other titan of the industry in the 1990s because DC really sets the groundwork for how Kingdom Come came about. So DC in the 1990s basically did a shock and awe campaign for all of their main titles. They either um, crippled, replaced, or killed, or even villainized most of their Death flagship of heroes. Superman, Nightfall, I forget the name of the Green Lantern run where... Emerald Twilight and New Dawn. Was that where Hal Jordan became the bad guy because he was taken over by the... What was, what was well, okay, so it's really weird how your Mandela are affecting it because that's Am what I? Jeff Johns did. So Am back I? then, what happened was in Green Lantern 46, this was part of the Death of Superman event, Coast City got nuked by yep. Mongol and Cyborg Superman, who was eventually Hank Henshaw, which is actually a Fantastic Four parody, so it's kind of weird how Marvel gets folded into that. Then in 47, he seemed to have restored himself, um, gone back on the road with Green Lantern, and 48 takes a really sharp turn because they replace the old writer, Gerald Jones, who belongs in prison. Go look up if you don't know why he is there. Oh, dear. He's a nonce. Um, and then it's replaced by Ron Mars, who invented Kyle Rayner, did a really long run on Green Lantern. Solid writer, right? Started fridging women, I assume. Solid writer. Good man. So what happens is... Hal has a massive meltdown and he tries to recreate the entirety of Coast City, all of his friends, relatives, ex-girlfriends, parents who he never got to say goodbye to and uh, tries to talk to them. His Green Lantern ring runs out of battery so the Guardians of Oa say you're using this for avarice, we're going to revoke your ring privileges and he draws from the Guardian's holographic image some power to get to Oa and he ends up fighting most of the Green Lanterns, leaves lots of them for dead, kills Kilowog outright and destroys the power battery and snaps Sinestro's neck. So then there's only Ganthet left and Ganthet just uh, materializes in an alleyway, runs into Carl Rayner wearing a Nine Inch Nails t-shirt and goes, you'll do, I guess, you're Green Lantern now. <laughs> Carl Rayner's great as well because he's basically DC Spider-Man. And it, it, it's, Carl Rayner's run is fantastic, but originally there was no parallax. Hal Jordan just had a mental breakdown and did a heel turn. So they retconned it. They retconned it because Jeff Johns wanted Hal Jordan back. But I actually think Hal should have, well, I like the idea that Hal redeemed himself in Final Night, because in Final Night he um, renounced his attempt in Zero Hour to remake the universe from Clean Slate and try and remake it in his own image, and sacrificed himself to um, become the Spectre eventually. So he took over from Jim Corrigan, who is in uh, Kingdom Come. What happens is Jeff Johns had him be possessed by an evil demon, but that doesn't really make sense because... Prior, in Gerard Jones's run, which will never be collected, of course, but in Emerald Dawn, I believe, was the two mini-series that set up Hal Jordan becoming the Green Lantern. Um, he was an alcoholic, he was a reckless driver, he couldn't hold down a relationship. Mark Wade did a Brave and the Bold series, setting up how Barry Allen and Hal Jordan became friends, and Hal would always move between jobs, move between girlfriends, whereas Barry was obviously settled down and very stable with Iris. He was a bit insecure and, and not very confident, and he admired Hal's free-thinking spirit, but Hal is a very dysfunctional person. And even though he's got a lot of willpower, he's a really interesting character, because he's kind of a Han Solo, of where he makes a conscious choice to be a hero, but it's not his, his natural inclination. So it makes sense he could have tipped over into villainy with, with a hell of a lot of grief. Um, and that's what they, they did to, to Hal to try and introduce and revitalise life into the Green Lantern title because the sales were kind of slumping. And, and it worked for Green Lantern, definitely. I'm sure it worked. Um, there was also, of course, Wally West, uh, assuming the mantle of the Flash after Crisis of Inf in, on Infinite Earths in 1986. And Mark Wade had taken over the Flash from William Mesner Loeb's. Mesner Loeb's had been writing Wonder Woman run at the time as well. Um, he took over Wonder Woman from 93 to 100. No, he took it over slightly before that, but Trial of Artemis was 93 to 100. Wonder Woman got kicked out of being Wonder Woman, got given a leather jacket and a black bob cut. Artemis, the very extreme Rob Liefeld-esque character. Wait, Wonder character. Woman got turned into a biker chick? Yeah. Fair play. Costume's not that bad. I get but. it. So Artemis was a, a lot more brutal. She was a, an Amazon from the Banner Maidol tribe, which was an exiled group of Amazons that lived in ancient Egypt. She ends up getting killed, um, and then Wonder Woman ends up getting taken over by John Byrne and gets put in a coma. Where you raise the specter of Nightfall and, and Death of Superman, they were going to do something to, to Wonder Woman. But Oh no. Yes. The edgy nineties, I know exactly where they would go with that. Very, very, very edgy, actually. So Wonder Woman in John Burns run in issue 124, she gets comatose fighting the demon Neron, who first appears in Mark Wade's Underworld Unleashed, which we'll mention. Uh, am I later. gonna feel gross hearing about this? You're definitely gonna feel gross. Uh, she then gets revived in Wonder Woman 127 and gets made into the Goddess of Truth, which doesn't last very long, but that's a, a short death and rebirth arc. Not what Mark Miller was gonna do, 
Mark Miller, the guy who wrote Kick Ass and Old Man Logan, for those who don't know, who really likes to use a particular thing as a plot device in his narratives, which can be used well and can be used intelligently to uh, expand the um, um, the emotions and scenarios that a story is exploring. Mark Miller doesn't do that. No, he uses it for pure shock value. Yes, and DC were willing to go along with it. Mark Miller proposed the rape of Wonder Woman. So, during a talk that took place on a thread in his own Miller World forums, Miller stated, I pitched this to DC for a laugh a few years back. Oh yeah, just a laugh, Mark Miller. Just a laugh. The idea was that the death of Superman, we had the rape of Wonder Woman, a 22-page rape scene that opened up into a gatefold at the end just like Superman did. <sighs> yeah, there's nothing to... There's, right, okay. It's like, just shocking and those, disgusting. Like... I've mentioned before, I'm currently reading through Berserk. Yeah. In Berserk, um, near the end of a very important story arc, there is a very graphic uh, uh, rape scene which goes on for quite a while. And the reason it does is to truly horrify you. Yes. <laughs> it was one of the few times reading a comic book where I've just not wanted to turn the next page. Because Same with Identity the Crisis, by the way. Identity yeah. Crisis actually uses rape as in its plot to truly horrify you and uh, add context to the complications of superheroism. Well, yeah, and in this, in, in Berserk, it's supposed to inform the character's decisions moving onwards. You experience the trauma that everybody involved went through. You see how it emotionally motivates and changes people. Yeah. So it's used to inform the characters and not just as a bit of shock value. Whereas Mark Miller just has it happen just because he feels like there needs to be an event on that page. This is the man who wrote Anybody Remember Wanted, the old film, the 2008 film with, mm. um, what's his face, uh, uh, the Scottish guy. He was in, he was Professor X in the X-Men First Class. Oh, Class James McAvoy and, yeah. um, and uh, Angelina Jolie was in it. Yes, that, that film with those two in it, uh, which I heard was a decent film, I've not watched it. The comic book version, he looks like Eminem, um, rapes people for fun, and the comic book ends on a splash page of his face grimacing with the caption saying, this is the look on my face as I'm effing you in the ass. Mark Ma Miller's disgusting. The problem is DC decided to go along with it. So despite Miller saying the story was just a joke he had made, he mentioned the fact that DC was actually considering publishing the story and had already had an artist draw a sketch for the comic's first page. So they did proof of concept for this thing. Um, this meant that DC's thinking? way of exploring a state of weakness to Wonder Woman in a similar vein to the previously Superman and Batman stories with the comic starting Wonder Woman being violated in public. They actually believe uh, this might be an apocryphal story, but I had heard related to this. They had considered part of the plot being that it was televised on the Times Square billboards. All of this just suggests to me we want to make it as shocking as possible, not as emotionally reson uh, resonant as possible. We just no. want it to be shocking. You know, this isn't going to be an act that really serves Wonder Woman's character in any way. As somebody who's supposed to be relatively pure, she's supposed to be an envoy from Paradise Island and the mm. Amazonians who is trying to uh, uh, sort of like mend man's way, so to speak. Yeah. Having her violated in such a gross way is just to try to subvert everything that's supposed to be good about her her character yeah not, not develop the character in any way at the time some of these shocking replacements or, or legacy reinventions and we'll get onto the flash later because that straddles a very good line and, and wade mm. back when he could write comics did things very respectfully some of these really benefited aquaman for example when he lost his hand to the school of piranhas and got the harpoon hand it it is what informed the jason momoa portrayal it made aquaman cool again and peter yeah, it was david definitely trying to do that well peter david did add a lot of depth to the atlantean mythos with the atlantis chronicles um he made aquaman a lot more of a conflicted character a lot more resentful he widened the chasm of conflict between um, mankind who could known to be polluting the oceans and an aquaman who had a whole dominion to protect so he, he made an interesting story by giving a aquaman a bit more grit well I, I think there's a lot of room for very interesting stories with aquaman even just on the basis of him being uh, either a prince or a king of Atlantis mm. under the water and all the duties that come with that so belonging in two worlds at the same time the 
underwater and the surface world it's all really interesting just a lot of a lot of people write him off because of let's be honest family guy cutaway gags and know. obviously the big bang theory of oh he can talk to fish lol which yeah. got put into the justice league movie because of joss whedon and jeff johns and and the jason momoa portrayal has done a lot to try and reclaim the character's um cool factor yeah he's a metalhead surfer dude and quite like Jason Momoa off air he seems kind he of seems fun. like an alright guy yeah. yeah he seems like a guy you could I'd quite like go to for go, a drink with I'd go for a drink and throw some axes with the dude yeah exactly uh, then there was Batman Nightfall of course which was actually created intentionally to rebuke the idea of image style heroism now a lot of people remember Batman Nightfall as just Batman's back getting broken but it <laughs> went much on much more than that for about a year across about four Batman titles with Asriel taking up the mantle of That's why Batman put the whole story together it's like this thing it's three omnibuses yeah, it's I own ridiculous. two of them only because the third one didn't go out of print and I actually kind of defend Nightfall drags on a little bit some of the art's kind of cool they invent some good new characters and unfortunately half the creators have now died Alan Grant's gone That's Denny O'Neill's gone it's Tragic. So Denny O'Neill invented Asriel in the Sword of Asriel miniseries, and in an interview he said, The genesis of the story was a two-part piece for Detective by Peter Milligan. Then I thought some big-time possibilities in the idea and assembled the troops to put together an outline, and this was the idea of um, a more violent Batman in ha inheriting the mantle of Batman from Bruce Wayne and defiling the legacy so Bruce Wayne had to take it Somebody back. Somebody without Bruce's principles. Yes, without the restraint. A monster who is not capable of reining himself in. Which was demonstrated in his very, very spiky outfit. Increasingly so, because it starts off with the gauntlets, then it becomes the Asbat, blue and gold with the flamethrowers, and then eventually the giant red cape that um, and helmet, which Bruce defeats him by making him crawl through the tunnels of the Batcave, a place he's unfamiliar with. He has to shed all his armour, and then when he gets to the the narrowest bit of the cavern, he just starts blubbering and hallucinating, and Batman pulls him up into the light and tries to redeem him. Oh, I do really like that symbolism right there. That's it's, quite nice. Nightfall is actually shockingly well written, other than the Chandra kin, kin solving part, where her adopted brother tries to use her telekinesis powers to destroy the world. Then she fixes Bruce's spine, and in doing so, she reverts to a childlike mental state. Well, I, I think a lot of people write off Nightfall because of, uh, or at least the story after Bruce's back is broken, mm. because they don't like Jean-Paul. But the point of it was that you weren't supposed to like him you were supposed to see that he was defiling the principles that batman stands by yeah. the gaudy outfit was supposed to be a visual representation of that you were supposed to not like him so that when bruce comes back and redeems him it's all the greater for it. well it works because denny says as was created to serve a plot need and that outfit was very popular as soon as it debuted um it was one of the marvel executives that created it. Joe Quesada, that's it. Mm. He was the original creator of the Azrael outfit. And by the time the comic had gone on long enough, people, the writers and the fans were really sick of seeing Asbat. So it, it worked to put them off saying, here you go, you got what you wanted, you got Rob Liefeld, Batman, now don't you hate it, let's go back to something good again. Um, apparently, so Denny O'Neill says this, uh, there's a interviewer here called Jack Tezak, and he says, In the Nightfall saga, Azrael was Batman for about a year. I know some fans were upset, sending death threats to DC Comics, stating that if Bruce Wayne wasn't put back in the Batsuit, you would lose loyal readers. How long was Azrael supposed to be Batman? Did those letters from the fans influence your decision on how long he would be Batman? And Denny said, No, we had most of the series, and particularly its length, planned from the get-go. What a lot of people don't know, if you watch uh, interviews with Chuck Dixon, for example, he said that Alan Grant... Graham Nolan, um, I'm not sure if Nolan was there actually, uh, Denny O'Neill, him and one other gentleman who worked with um, Joe Kelly, Doug Mensch, they went on a writer's retreat and planned out all of Nightfall across a few whiteboards in about a week. Oh and really? They knew what was going to happen, what characters they were introducing, how it would be paced going forward and it pretty much, it, almost to the T, stuck to that structure and they knew it's because they wanted to create a repudiation of the idea that the batman should be darker and more edgy um something which we'll get onto obviously in in kingdom come in a little bit and he said i wouldn't i would have been bothered more bothered if the series if the readers had liked Azrael, that they would have loved a nastier batman and i would have had problems with that and then 
Chuck Dixon added in another interview, we were going to show fans that their idea of a perfect Batman was wrong, and boy did we show them. That was the plan. We really wanted to convince readers that this change was permanent. We were going to keep it for six months longer than we did, but the reaction to Asbats was causing sales to slide quite dramatically. They miss Bruce Wayne, and we miss Bruce Wayne. So, there was a little bit of wiggle room in the actual timeline of when Azrael was going to be dispensed with, but they always knew they were going to try and intentionally put readers off, and then draw them back in with the return of Bruce Wayne as... And, and, Sales-wise, it rebounded and it worked very well. I was going to say, that sounds like a clever marketing almost to uh, put people off and then bring them back to really cause a massive spike in the sales. The most successful one of this was Death of Superman, of course, as you alluded to. Because Death of Superman, Superman 75, it had a gimmick cover, it had the fold-out, um, still does in the omnibus. Some of the art's fantastic. They specifically created a villain to kill Superman. Yeah, and the artwork as well for the issues where Doomsday and Superman are fighting counts down. So as the pages go along, the page panels get increasingly less. So there's like three panels a page in one issue, two panels a page in the other issue, and it's all just splash pages in Superman 75. So it's meant to be this really operatic battle. And to this day, it looks fantastic. Whether or not after the fact, when all four Superman titles got inherited by various characters, it was a very deep story is a whole other question, but it was a very successful marketing gimmick. And it involved pretty much the entire DC universe. At, at one point, Bill and Hillary Clinton give the eulogy at Superman's funeral. They're drawn. We'll show the panels. Oh, I thought you meant that they actually went on television. No, it would have been quite interesting, wouldn't that it? That would have been incredible. Because the American public pretty much bought that Superman had died. It was in the newspapers for the day. So, Well, it was the kind of kickstart of the gimmick that happens all the time now. You can count... Um, I think Marvel tried to recreate it, like, what, 10 years ago almost now, with the death of Wolverine? Yes. And all sorts of and stories. And Captain America. Yeah, Captain America. These stories happen all the time now. Yes. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.